Hello and welcome to another edition of Razor Wire. And today we have what has commonly become our quarterly podcast where I sit down with both Richard Cassidy and Oliver Rochford and we discuss kind of future tech, current situations, how that might change the future of technology within the information security space and sometimes the technological space as well. So sit down, buckle up, and listen, because it's certainly going to be a lively conversation. So as usual for our quarterly look at what is going on in the security industry, the technology, sometimes we talk about AI, sometimes we talk about issues in the industry, sometimes we talk about marketing, which we were just doing before we came on camera. We're going to be talking about predominantly this whole kind of lock bit, take down, back up, what it means for the industry, what it means for like technology moving forwards and things like threat intelligence, that kind of thing. And as per usual, I have the two most fantastic co-hosts for this particular piece, Richard Casty and Oliver Rochford. Do you want to say hi, guys, and kind of do a, a little intro? Richard, do you want to take this one first? Sure. Uh, good to be back, uh, especially with uh, Oliver. Um, thank you very much, as always. So, Richard Cassidy, done a few of these now. Uh, I'm currently a field CISO at a major cyber resilience and data security company. Uh, this is year 24 overall in the industry. Most of that's been spent in deep cybersecurity, uh, threat intelligence, threat persona mapping, things like this and uh, advising businesses on how to do that stuff better. No doubt we'll cover some of it in the uh, in this podcast. Absolutely. And Oliver? Yeah, Oliver Rochford. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm the chief futurist at the time of futurist. It's my own advisory company. I do technology advisory for technology buyers, sellers, investors around cybersecurity, mainly like security operations focus, yeah. Some of the biggest news recently is that the whole lock bit takedown, and we all saw the uh, the announcement and... You know, all the collaborative people who were involved or proudly showing their flags and institutions, sort of logos and what have you. And, you know, everybody was very proud that Lockbit had finally been taken down. I mean, how did you feel when you first sort of saw that? I mean, I was, I was relieved that now we can talk about something other than AI. That was my first, <laughs> my first impulse. Our last podcast today, I got that. some really good coverage, but okay. I'm sure it has, but but overall, you know, I was, at, you know, at some point you've just flogged that horse too much. Um, anyway, we've, uh, I, it, I thought it was quite intriguing, but um, t to be honest with you, I, I saw a lot of people uh, immediately on social media say, yay, we've done it, we've done it. Um, but immediately there were also people saying, okay, unless there's arrests, it's not going to take long for them to come back up. And then the guesswork started coming at how long will it take for them to get back up. So I think it was like a, a, this feeling that it was a little, little win, you know? <laughs> a little win, yeah. A, a little win. As soon as the news broke, I, for me, I, I had decided, yeah, ah, this, is, this is not what the industry thinks it is. Um, I mean, first of all, you have to call out the fact that the reason that they got breached themselves because of a PHP vulnerability, which yeah, you know, just, just goes to show you patch management's a problem on whatever side of the fence you're on. Uh, so I found that kind of funny. But I, I, I my opinion is the way that I believe the law enforcement agencies handled it was incorrect uh, because they decided to gamify back what they had discovered and found. And, you know, they created this website with countdowns for releasing the name of, you know, various individuals and 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 then, you know, other details, including decryption keys. I get it. I get that you, it, I don't know, it shows the persona of some of the people that revolve in this. If you really have infiltrated <clears throat> to the depth that you said you have a group of that propensity in the ransomware world, Great threat intelligence tells you keep your mouth shut, monitor them for as long as you possibly can, and 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 see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Because I can't imagine they exhausted every possible lead that they have found, um, and I don't know how much of it's bravado versus uh, uh, the, 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 you know really having taking down lockbit and the, the whole taking down lockbit thing. Well, to, to Oliver's point, 
it didn't happen, you know. And I and I had I had was asked in interviews. I I spoke to some analysts and and so on and so forth. I said, look, this is not them finished. They will be back, and I predict in a magnitude of weeks uh, at most. And lo and behold, they were within four to five days. And so, you know, look, good to see. And I, th- I think the benefit, the the goodness from this for me is I haven't seen such a concerted effort amongst so many agencies uh, as I have for the lockbit takedown as uh, before. So it goes to show that as an international law enforcement collaboration, we've, we've definitely found a way to, to make that work because I, I do believe we've been far too silent in the past, which is, which is the, the, the antithesis of good cyber threat intelligence and capabilities. So it's an interesting move. And, and then the badness from this is, okay, PHP vulnerability was the, was the initial entry point. If, you know, the they, the people behind this, the groups will learn and they will learn what they yeah. did wrong. They will look at how the data uh, was used against them to be able to release decryption keys for various customers. And that will only help them to mature their operations even more uh, in future campaigns. So I, I do think we, we've probably got got some progress, but but equally we we've probably made, I say we, the way this was handled, I believe, probably wasn't the best way I would have handled it had I been leading an operation like this personally. Um, anyway, so that's my initial thought on it. Yeah, I I, I kind of fall in line with that one. Um, when when news first broke, I thought, oh, we're we're being a little bit we're being a little bit loud about this, aren't we? And then I had a good laugh when they said, oh, you know, a hundred million. Yeah, we've we've stopped the hundred million. That's 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 the hundred million. You know that, that allegedly that they ransomware. I went really. Do you really think it's only a hundred million? Oh no 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 no. And then lo and behold, a couple of days later, it's like oh, it's actually over one trillion. It's like now you're kind of getting close to the number that this has probably probably been. And you know, I, I had a, a number of conversations with customers and people that I know in the industry, and they were like, "Oh, you know, it's really good. They've kind of been taken down." I said, oh, "No, no, these guys have still got all that money. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll still have a large percentage of it, and this won't stop them. They'll be back." Um, and then, lo and behold, there was they came back, and then there was that announcement. It was quite funny because the the one of the key figures behind it said, "Yeah, I got a little bit." I got a little bit kind of like sitting on my heels, really. I, I wasn't really keeping an eye on the PHP vulnerabilities. So, you know, I've learned a lesson there, but I was just focusing on the money we were making. <laughs> I was like, Jesus. Yeah. I think what this has kind of shown, I think most InfoSec people looked at it and went, that amount is just the tip of the iceberg and these guys are going to be back pretty quick. Um, and I must admit, I thought it would be a few weeks. I didn't think it would be five days. Uh, but it just kind of goes to show that, you know, with that amount of money comes quite a significant ability to recover. And maybe yeah. some some organizations should learn that if you invest in cybersecurity a little bit more, maybe you too can kind of like come back from these kinds of events a little bit faster than than what history has shown. Yeah, I mean, their, their infrastructure seems highly resilient and it seems uh, very quick to spin up, right? You can see the professionalization there, um, cybercrime as a service. Um, but at the same time, it's interesting you mention the gamification, Richard, because I thought that too. Taunting them, uh, is that really a good good investment of police time? I'm, I'm, like, I'm Honestly, I'm, I'm serious. Is that, I know it feels satisfying and we can all laugh about it, but was that really the best investment of that time? At the same time, without the arrests, I don't know. All you've done is pre-warned them now, right? And that's the interesting thing. They took down the infrastructure. They didn't take down the group. There's a fundamental difference there, you know. They did do some arrests, didn't they? Um, looking back through the... But, I mean, it wouldn't have been anybody of any significance, I'm guessing. Oh. The, 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 the main, the, keep in mind, the main ringleaders behind these things, they are sat in safe harbour countries from their point of view, places where who adversaries who have no intention of, of handing them over, right? Yeah, but look, and let, let's not underestimate the resilience of <clears throat> the ransomware as a service model. Uh you know, recently uh, Black Hat, uh, ALPHV, apparently are staging their own takedown uh, for whatever reason. That there's there's reports that state that they've recycled the uh, FBI seizure page 
uh, from from last year and and re uh, published it on their site for whatever reason. It, it's it's as if they're trying to play a game back and and dictate that you know they're they're seizing operations potentially think that maybe they take some heat off them. I don't know. Maybe they were spooked by what's happened with Lockbit. But the, but the other point that I wanted to try to make here was. There are other groups. I mean, if you just do a little bit of homework into the ransomware as a service model and all of the groups that support each other, you've got to understand that all this data is shared uh, openly and it's a commission basis based upon who does the breach versus who provides the data that supports the breach and there's various commission structures amongst them. Um, and there are even groups that work as second line, right? So if the lockbit uh, tool sets don't work, well, let's go to the 3AM group and use other tool sets and other coding languages. So... It, it just, again, the, the point is, yes, great to say that international law enforcement has the capability to collaborate, to, to, to really track what these groups are doing. But, but in the long run, you're only going to disrupt and you're not going to destroy. Um, and, and I think for those watching the podcast, keep that mindset when you're thinking about how you're going to stand up to the evolving landscape of ransomware. Uh, you don't think law enforcement's going to save your day. It, it, it won't. And as, as showed in this, they just like to play around with these groups and gamify it. Um, I don't think we've had any serious results. I wouldn't say it has no impact because it does keep a pressure on the group, right? It, 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 it sets them back a little bit for a while. Um, but ultimately, unless we can agree on actually arresting them internationally, it's, it's hard. You know, it, 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 there's a difference between shutting down an operation and shutting down a group. At the end of the day, I mean, there's a lot that goes into this, and I think there's this is where that kind of high, uh, the cyber intelligence side comes in. I mean, the last few years, we've seen a number of um, kind of tool sets and organizations coming out of the, uh, who are starting to, you know, tote themselves as like threat intelligence, that kind of thing. Um, and it's it's now becoming i mean i'm doing a talk on it in a couple of weeks time actually depending upon obviously when this podcast come out um it, it's an interesting landscape to look at because you're absolutely right i mean law enforcement i'm going to be really unfair to law enforcement guys so you know i apologize to any law enforcement people out there but in this case you, you, you are pretty useless you know <laughs> You can, as 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 Oliver said, you can take down and you can disrupt and you can put pressure on, but ultimately it's not going to stop a thing. Well, I wouldn't say useless. They don't have the means. No, you know? that's why I say it's it's pretty useless. It's like you're not going to these people. Are, as you said, the, the, these people are all hiding away in various different parts of the world that you're not going to get get have a reach to. As much as certain countries like to say how they police the universe, nobody cares. You know. Um, and even then, most of the really good people who you know what you're doing, they're probably part of organized crime anyway. You know, organized crime are not going to be sat there looking at this going, oh, this is a really interesting new way of making money. No, they're going to be, they're going to be as deep into it as they feasibly can be. And these people have been <laughs> evading law enforcement for more years than you care to count. It does beg the question whether there's actually almost like a, a founder ecosystem now for cybercrime as a service. Like, are they actually... Um, starting new groups, that kind of thing. Like Dragon's um, Den. It's, you know, <laughs> well, well, I mean, look, there, there, there's, there's certain tech ecosystems as well where before you get these initial, like the first successful people to kind of invest and pass on that knowledge, it, it's it's hard to do. But I, I get the feeling that there are multiple generations that work now. And of course, at that point, it's it's something where they're just popping up like mushrooms whenever you put them down. It's fairly easy to spin up the infrastructure as we've just seen, it's, they just basically move it from one provider or to another. Um, so it's very repeatable as a process. They didn't need to build all of this manually by the looks of it. And so it, it, I think it, it's, it's interesting the fact that it's um, professionalized to such a strong degree within about, ooh, last time I looked at this market was about five or six years ago. And back then the focus was still very much on zero days. There were a couple of ransomware as a service operators just starting, but they've They've come a long way in a short time. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always said in industry that um, you have, don't underestimate the uh, power of progress from an adversary perspective for, for the reason, I mean, we, we did a podcast, I think it was last year, James, around the psychology yeah. of tribe, cybercrime. You know, you got <laughs> these are individuals that, uh, some of them are politically motivated, no doubt, others are backed by 
government uh, uh, agencies where we know who they are. And then some are just saying, look, you know what, it, it may be easier to do this. It, it, you know, if, if I join a group, if I become a part of an ecosystem, I'm a data miner or I'm a malware writer or whatever it is, and I'll get a very small percentage of, of any attack. And, you know, th th we haven't yet tackled the ability to de-anonymize a lot of the payments that are, uh, are making their way through the various um, cryptocurrency environments. So, you know, there's, there's so many fundamental problems in the industry that supports ransomware and ransomware as a service that uh, we've got to look there. It's, it's, it, you've got to look at the infrastructure they use to monetize what they do. Um, I, I'm not saying understanding how they operate from a malware perspective, from the actual code is not important. Yes, it is. But at the end of the day, they're only doing it because they can monetize it and they're only able to monetize it because of A, well, it, because of two things, and all of you mentioned one of them. We don't really have extradition capabilities at the level we need them globally, and, and that's not going to change. We don't have a, a solution to that because I'm not, we're not going to see Russia and China jump on that bandwagon anytime soon. Um, and the second is, yes, they can move money pretty easily and anonymously. You, you mentioned the, the, the politically motivated element. But like One of the things which is driving the professionalization is that there are nation states involved to, to bypass sanctions. North Korea is a prime example. Russia is a very good example of that increasingly. And of course, that, that, that can frame the taunting in a different light. If you're basically taunting someone's secret agents, I could see that makes sense. Um, you know, but, but at the same, for, for a simple mistake in that. Um, but, if, but if there is a... a um, I think there's been an uptick since the geopolitical situation has heated up as well. Yeah. Well, I think I think a lot of people out there have realised that they can probably earn more money on the dark side of the force than they can do on the light side of the force. I mean, let's face it, you know, there's there's I mean, in the what in the last couple of months there's been this whole in fact a bit a bit longer than that. You know, the economy in the West has been in a bit of a, a bit of a panic. You know, you've been seeing a lot of people being let go, made redundant, and all the rest of it. Some of them are citing AI. I don't think that's it. I think a lot of it is, you know, the economy is just generally in a pretty, pretty, or it's going down a pretty nasty, nasty route. Um, and a lot of these people are saying, right, I, I can earn more working on that side than I can do ever working on the other side, or I just do both. You know, there's this whole big thing about overworking at the moment. There's no reason why one programmer can work working on one side of the fence during the day and then on the other side of the fence in the evening and get double bubble. In fact, probably more than double bubble. They'll get, probably get paid more for working for the malware guys. And there's very little chance they're going to get caught because they're developers. So they're all, all they're doing is releasing code. Somebody else is dealing with it. Somebody else is handling the, the you know, what goes on with it. So as long as they're kind of not doing anything dumb with the code, then you know it's very unlikely it's going to get back to them. Um, and I think what's what's you, you, both of you are, are very much correct. You know, the nation states haven't helped the matter because I'm guessing what the nation states are doing is saying, right, I don't want you to attack us. What I want you to attack is these guys over here. We consider them an enemy state, and if you do that, then we'll leave you alone. We won't touch you. We won't go near you, and we'll um, maybe even help you a little bit with a, a bit of monetary value. Um, and make sure that, you know, if anybody gets arrested, then they, you get arrested for short periods of time. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, let's face it, when uh, Abignail, the guy from Catch Me If You Can, you know, um, or the film was based off of his life. Okay, it's very highly stylized, but, you know, he got caught, put away, and they literally, shortly after he got put away, turned around and said, oh, do you want to come and work for us and work out your, uh, you know, Work out your your uh, oh uh, prison sentence, kind of doing the same thing for us, and you know it's a, it's an attractive route to go down, especially if you're part of a country where you don't get support, you don't have you know the the support that sometimes you get in some more Western countries like the UK. You know, if you're having to feed your family and you're a talented coder, then why the hell wouldn't you do that? You know, people follow the money. I mean, you're right. I mean, on the one hand, so to the nation state, if you look at the Wirecard scandal, one, I think the COO, he's still missing. They reckon he was turned in 2014 by Russian intelligence. If you look at the the big um, 1MB scandal from Malaysia, where they where they, they basically stole a whole lot of money from, from the Malaysian government, there was an operative there who's fled to China. 
And he's basically, and then of course we have the Edward Snowden example, which is I think the prime example, right? But when, when but you're right about the monetary aspect. But when I was doing research into this back at Tenable, into the kind of economics behind it, we have a lot of countries who have an oversupply of educated technical people. If you think of India, Pakistan, if you think of Brazil, they don't really have the jobs available to them. And if there's no extradition treaty, you can set this up pretty legitimate looking, right? There are, if you think of some of those tech scam tech support scammers, they're operating out of companies that look very much like a call center. They're employed. You know, I've, seen, I've, I've seen the videos of the takedown of those actually, which I mean, yeah. anybody listening, go on YouTube and do a search on the takedown of some of those 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 uh, sort of scam phone things. It's really interesting the way that it works, and it's it's a bit of a laugh as well. Some of the some of the fun that the guys have against them, you know. But you're absolutely right. Of course, once you put a nationalistic or an adversarial taint on it, that's for your justification. If you're, mm. if you're at war or if you're in opposition to another country, you can justify doing it to their people. It's okay. This is part of, you know, so, so I think there's a whole element there. Um, but but yeah, right, I think it's for a lot of the operatives, it's financially motivated, but it's about who's pulling the strings, who's financing it, who's, who's, who's driving it. And there's good examples there coming out of China, even going back as far back as about 2012, 2013, that different government agencies had their own sponsored hacking groups in opposition competing with one another, right? That's the interesting thing, that right? it wasn't just one nation-sponsored group, there were several. I've, I always like to be the pragmatist in industry when it comes to, okay, so, so what? So, so so what for the businesses? I don't mean so what, it's valuable information. I mean, if you're sitting there as a leader in, in whatever part of the business you work in, and I'm talking more to kind of CISO cybersecurity leads, so all of this is scary stuff, so what do you do about it? Well... It, you 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 understand that the capability in these groups is far greater than you've probably ever realized, and it's getting better. And more more blood is coming into that industry for various reasons of psychology and macroeconomics. And so, and what you're doing, what the industry is doing to protect and detect is not working, right? We know that. You have to almost embrace the fact that breach is going to occur. Um, and so, yeah, and that comes just down to knowing you know, what, what, what's going to be your worst nightmare? What, what, what would turn the lights off in your business where it to be breached or extorted? Um, and, and you've got to do the best you possibly can around the protection mechanisms and around the, the capabilities of resilience and stuff like this. And I think one of the most underserved things that people drive, I mean, threat intelligence, some people talk about in a moment, I'm sure, but hey, using the right threat intelligence for who you are, I mean, <clears throat> A lot of conversations I have, I was with a very large government agency only last week uh, that are responsible for some very big elements of the UK economy. And I, I asked them these questions, okay? <clears throat> what data are you protecting? And it was a tumbleweed moment, right? This government department had no idea of what data silos represented operation for those, for that organization. I said, okay, forget, forget that. Who do you believe in partnership with the NTSC and, and, and other agencies are you up against based upon what you do as a government agent, as a government entity? Um, and they had no idea either. They hadn't done the homework on the types of incidents they would see, the types of APT groups they'd be up against. Um, and gosh, if that's the state, I'm not saying that I'm surprised by that. I'm, I've been in industry long enough to know that that's, that's half the course. But it just goes to show we're still banging your head off the same old wall. We're still... We're reliving Einstein's definition of insanity day in, day out in this industry. Um, and, and what we've learned from Lockbit Takedown is they're just as capable at recovery and, and reoperationalization than, and, and in, as quicker than I thought. I didn't think it was going to be two or three days. My goodness, I've got at least a couple of weeks. So, so, so what are we doing that isn't working and how do we change it? You've got to look at that. In some, some respects, you also have to look at it and say, what lessons can we learn from it? And it's like, you know, they are so well funded now. You know, the first time they got the 100 million, 10 million, 50 million, that buys you a hell of a lot of security, you know. Um, and it also pays a lot of good developers to give you really good security. They're not going for the commercial stuff that we, we use. They'll be going for their own versions. And some of them may even be, I mean, I know they buy licenses for all the standard kind of protective technologies at the moment, and they actually kind of unleash their people like, uh, 
on them in a similar fashion that we have bug bounty and the rest of it. And even the, the guy at Lockbit turned around and gave a bug bounty out. Did you see that bit? Yeah. He turned around and said, if you can give over the details, what does he say? He said, if you can give over the details of uh, Lockbit Sup's real name over a direct yeah. message, they'd, they'd give him a million quid or a million dollars. Possibly a few bullets, but it's very much a mirror. Yeah, it's very it's a mirror of the legitimate supply chain, right? I mean, this is the difficult thing, you know. We'll go into threat intelligence. You know, we have morals; they do not. So, you know, and they have a a, a definite need. They've done their risk management. It's like, okay, so if we don't invest in security and protecting ourselves and our identities then, you know, we're toast. You know, we get arrested. And it's horrible to get arrested. I mean, assuming you're in a place where you can get arrested. Or large group yeah. parts of our group will get taken down. And, you know, similar to any organization, you take down a large chunk of, say, their access brokers, you target access brokers, all of a sudden you're you're in their eco economy anyway. You know, it's going to get a lot harder for them to generate money because that's where they get a lot of their access. Um so they, they do support one another better. They do spend far better on protecting themselves. And as Richard said, they, they came back up in five days. I don't know any company, even mid-sized company, that can get back in five days. Not totally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it takes weeks. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, but what Richard said about the, the the threat modeling, I found really interesting as well. Because, like, if, if I look at the developments of ransomware, and I still speak to people who think that well, we have disaster recovery, so they haven't heard of, of double or triple extortion. They, they don't <laughs> understand that, that that recently a company. So I, I don't know if you heard about this. Um, what a ransomware group actually notified a regulator about a company about a breach to get them into trouble <laughs> because <laughs> they refused to pay the ransom. So, so all of these means that they have, and, and so once you start understanding that actually it's not just about restoring the encrypted data, it's about stopping data, you know, data exfiltration, you have all of these threat scenarios that you can model. And what's the worst case scenario? What Richard said about identifying your data, what's the worst case if somebody publishes that? What's the worst case if somebody mm. contacts your customers with this data? All of these things that people, where you can put a business angle to it, I think is, is something where... But if you get a good consultancy, you should be doing that, to be fair. Well, we do, we, do, we do, you know, I mean, we do a lot of analysis on our customers and, and how the business runs and what have you, what their key assets mm. are, all the usual stuff that, you know, you can you can, you can need to do um, to build the security and the defense in depth around that um, rather than kind of like a, a one peg fits all. You know, I don't, don't, I always say to customers, don't believe what the vendors tell you. Sit down and analyze your own environment first. Don't drink the Kool Aid until you've actually seen what it's made of. Um, and I say I put that into as a, as a significant part of my book, which you know I just thought I'd put in a little plug there. But um, you know, ultimately, you know, you've got to understand your environment and so on and so forth, uh, and you've got to look at your defense in depth as part of that. But I mean, a large chunk of defense in depth now is threat intelligence because I mean, Richard put it put it quite right earlier on. Law enforcement, I haven't got a bloody clue what they're protecting. You know, I mean, you know, he was in a government organization, sorry, not not law enforcement, government organization and saying, so so what are you protecting? And they didn't know. They didn't know what data they've got. Probably got lots of data on lots of things. And if you believe Snowden in certain parts of the world, they've got even more data that they probably shouldn't have. And they're still not securing that particularly well because all it took was some one guy to find it and go, oh, look at what these guys have got on you lot. Um, I don't know. I mean, threat intelligence, what tools have we got available to us? I mean, the last last section of this, you know, we should probably talk about that. Where are we currently with that? I mean, there's a couple <laughs> of firms out there that do, you know, threat intelligence, but I mean, how effective are they? Are they, do they have, uh, have they rooted down into the deep, dark depths of the dark web and really know what they're talking about? Or is the, are they just skimming the surface? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, I find I find it genuinely fascinating in industry that we have the blueprints for thousands upon thousands of attacks in every form of version you can think of. <clears throat> and so 
as in as an organization, we we already know what's going to happen. We can already play the book that says, "Here's how it's got. You're going to get fished. Someone's going to click on something they shouldn't, or download a piece of, of malware, or it's going to be a zero day in in a, an application you use, which gives." you know, reverse shell access, whatever it is, which ultimately ends up in dropping something to take control of privileges to to escalate if needed, and then to go and find data and, and you know, um, and, and, and exfiltrate it preferably. But if not, you know, hackers can take screenshots of things if they don't want to actually send data in bits away. Um, and so what? why are we still in a scenario where we seem to be surprised every time there's another ransomware breach. There's another malware breach. It's like, oh, wow, gosh, it's still happening. Yeah, it is still happening. Uh, but you, you, come on, let's learn from what we've seen. I mean, look at it. Yeah. Whatever your role is in, in business, risk, compliance, cybersecurity, learn from the lessons of the past. Wisdom is knowledge without pain. <clears throat> now, I'll caveat that with, of course, you can't, you can't, you can't fix things that users are going to do. You can't mitigate every zero day threat capability but to Oliver's point what you can do is say okay let's assume all that's going to go bang what is most important to my business yeah. and, and what risk can I accept in terms of data breach or data exfiltration I mean really we want zero risk around that but that's just not possible so we have to limit the blast radius as I call it um, and so to come on to your question James the industry doesn't help the poor customers we I mean, the, I, the amount of startups we're seeing year on year offering the latest widget, no wonder CISOs and decision makers are like, oh my God, what do I do about this? Um, I, it's just insane. I, I mean, the, the, the investment in startups is slightly down. I think it's a 451 is it billion. Oh gosh, I think it might be no million. It's, it's got to be less than that. It's, it's down 31% from 2023. Uh, sorry, the figures last year are down 31%. Apologies, I get that out right. Um, yeah, I, I just to add to that, yeah, I saw I saw 450 million. Million, there you go, yes. And so, and interestingly, um, you know, the countries that, uh, so the USA, 71,000 startups uh, it, uh, already, sorry, in, in last year, India was second place with 13,000. Oh. And then if we break that down into its constituent parts, fintech represents the highest percentage of that. Uh, the life sciences and healthcare, which is no surprise, uh, we're seeing some really good, good innovation there, and then artificial intelligence, unfortunately, um, and then you got gaming and a few others. Um, but say in cybersecurity, oh my God, how many new companies? I mean, now that I I have CISO in my title, if I just showed you my LinkedIn day in day out, the amount of products that I tried to get sold mm -hmm. to go to have it, and they all do something similar. I mean, it's I I really don't know how industry decision makers are, are, are navigating this at the moment. There's just too much noise. But, but, but it's interesting you say that because like I, I, I've discovered that AI is a very good example. In our industry, we have something I call AI poverty. And you can say the same thing for intelligence because if you're a well-funded, mature company, you have a SOC, you're FANG, you're maybe a tech, tech provider, you might be a Fortune 1000, you can get a lot of value out of threat intelligence. If you're a mid-sized business, you have a deficit. You don't want another source of alerts. You don't want another thing to review. You need something to help you automate stuff. And the quality of EVA is not high enough. Not for the anomaly detection, not for the threat intelligence. You can do the low value machine readable stuff where you have a list of IOCs, but that is for lowest value you can derive out of threat intelligence. So if you don't have the means to be able to use all of this, you're, you're, you're basically disadvantaged, massively disadvantaged. And we do have a cutoff across companies where, and you're right, I spoke to maybe 20 startups over the past six months. One of them out of 20 said they weren't going after the Fortune X. They're driven a bit by investor demands, but ultimately a lot of it is to do with deal sizes. It's hard to grow on very small bite sizes. And more importantly, it's hard to compete when you're trying to do that. So I don't think it's an easy thing in our industry to actually thrive, at least from a VC's point of view, at least from a large money place point of view, if you want to do an IPO or something based on going after the middle market. I don't know how we improve those economics, but it, it, it's a problem, you know? Yeah. Both sides. Maybe we should go to the ransomware guys. I mean, those guys are turning some serious dough. Um, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, some people have decided that. I, 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 I'll be honest. So I, I joke sometimes. If Bitcoin would have been around twenty five years ago, I would not be working for a vendor, right? I mean, but uh, <laughs> you made you great a great point, which serves that even though it's tongue in cheek, uh, James, I, it serves the what we're what I'm about to say. To get into the industry today, in, into the commercial industry, is bloody difficult. Um, and harder than I think it's ever been. And thank God I've been around long enough that, you know, people seem to, you know, take my experience as gospel, and that's a good thing. But so these poor women and men, our teenagers more than likely, are probably looking at this thinking, oh my God, I've got to get all these tick boxes, all these certifications, or I could just join that group here and maybe look at learning stuff like this because, you know, that's an easier path into it. And then before they know it, they're sucked into something they're making easy money, um, and there's a, a relative level of anonymity. So we're not doing ourselves any favors. We're making it difficult for these relatively talented people to get onto the, the light side of their course uh, rather than being, being, being you know, enticed by the dark side. Uh, but but, but, that, but that's, that's what I meant about some countries basically having this oversupply of technical people. If you're unable, if you have the skill set, but you can't get a good legitimate job, it's it's an attractive avenue. Like, if, if what are you going to do? Not work. And in some countries, it is sometimes the best option that people have available. Another thing where we have to change the economic incentives, right? I mean, in all honesty, I think the best defense that 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 we can have threat intelligence, you know, uh, is in the people that we have looking after our organizations. You know, it's experienced, well-rounded well-trained individuals trained from the community not not from some arbitrary you know i'll be honest guys university course which is like seven years out of date i mean okay you can learn a few things i'm not saying you can't but this market moves so bleeding quick one one minute you're you're all up to date five minutes later you go on holiday and something else happens and you have no idea what's going on and it takes you a bit of time to catch up you know you can't you can't rest in this kind of industry um you know, us on the light side, as we keep terming it, you know, we're, we're constrained by budgetary problems, by, you know, uh, ethics, morals, and all the rest of it. Uh, and stupid. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of it is just, just held back by stupid, let's be honest. I, I didn't want to say that, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, there, there, are, there are certainly some interesting people who have interesting opinions who, who aren't in the information security community or don't have any idea what they're talking about. Um, I think this is the dangerous thing, and I think the only answer to, to uh, you know, the criminal industry in cybersecurity is is by trying to outperform them from a you know from a protective view you know through the people okay. that we have yes you you'll need tools you'll need you'll need all kinds of stuff i'm not saying that that vendors don't have their place um i do wish vendors marketing and i know you do a lot of marketing oliver so i apologize this i do wish they didn't say that whatever their product was was the be all and end all and will save the whole universe if you buy it if you will, if you'll invest the quarter of a million dollars, uh, you know, in their product, and then you spend the quarter of a million, you realise it doesn't actually do anything that it said on the tin, and uh, yeah, now you're quarter of a million out of your budget, and your boss is saying, well, why did we buy this useless pile of rubbish that sat there in the corner? I hate that marketing. I die on that hill on almost every job. But I get Good. outvoted. I'm That's sorry. I'm here. sorry. <laughs> I get. I get. I get outvoted. I don't understand it either. But apparently, it's all revolutionary and game changing. So let's just move on. <laughs> you know that's if you honestly it's like I, I said this i would never ever that's my test for marketers to hire them if they write a press release where it says revolution and game changing i will not hire them honestly it's like it's it's so meaningless at this point but you will see it in almost every second press release and it's lost any any form of meaning at this juncture we've had so many revolutions we've changed the game so many times wow no wonder nobody knows what's going on you know <laughs> Listen, it's been trial by fire. Um, I, I, having worked in marketing as well, and technically I suppose I still do a little bit, uh, I had no idea just how much crap people in my position got and the crap that I was sending the very same people, uh, you know, only two years ago. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a convert. I have been converted. Uh, I, we, we need to stop the FUD. Um, but I don't think it's going to stop, I'm being honest with you. 
Um, cells. But, you know, back to the point of threat intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> so I talked about something on a podcast ages ago as well, James, or something about kind of the tribal knowledge or the tribal security yeah. awareness kind of model. Um, what I was referring to was what has now become regulation. Uh, so, you know, a good example of that is NIST 2 and DORA both have very specific articles related to threat intelligence information sharing, um, not just up to the ESAs, uh, uh, so therefore the regulator assessors themselves, but amongst your peer organizations. And I think that's that's the kind of right shift we needed because in my opinion, even if you subscribe to threat intelligence as a service models, the issue that you tend to find is deriving context of that those threat intel fees to your organization. And you typically need a full-time team internally just to derive that context. Yeah. And by the way, AI is not the answer there because um, there's a long way to go and, and that's probably another podcast. But it's good to see that regulations are making companies think about this. How do I gather threat intel? It, what's the context of it? How do I share it? When do I know how to share it? When, this is the right shift, I think, because it's great that we all consume threat intelligence, but what we've got to do is make sense of it and then share that sense laterally, in my opinion. Um, but, but there's a cultural problem. When half the industry beats up on someone who discloses a breach, there's a disincentive to disclose breaches or intelligence. Mm. And so we need a cultural change there. I remember a, C, like a survey that Gartner did, I think it was in 2014, 2015, and they asked CISOs, would they share threat intelligence to receive it for free or rather pay and not share? And it was like 60-something percent in Europe said they'd rather pay and not share. And of course, the whole logic there falls apart. Share what? Like, if you're not sharing, what are you buying? Where's this intelligence supposed to come from? And so there's a, there's a cultural issue there. But at the same time, as long as a competitor is willing to beat you up with it publicly, as long as vendors are willing to use it mm. for FUD, people are not going to want to share that information. There has to be a better understanding that you're going to get breached. It's going to happen. And we've been trying to put that across, but it hasn't stuck. There's still a lot of... Um, well, a lot of ambulance chasing going on, you know. I mean, there have been a few. I mean, I know we're coming to the end of our time rapidly, and I just say, you know, the, the the information security community at large, you know, not not the vendors, not not the organisations, the OS organisations like Microsoft and Google, who you know, big tech and so on and so forth. You know, information security people and individuals, as on the whole, okay, we've got a few lunatics in here I and mean, a few weirdos um but we, we can work miracles when we actually get together let's be honest um you know because we're all in the same role and we all understand how difficult it is i don't think you know other than a few very interesting personalities who have obviously got very large egos most conversations i have with any other infosec professional in this industry is really positive and they're willing to share info. It's like, oh, yeah, no, we had that problem. Yeah, it, you know, it was absolute nightmare. This is how we fixed it. Yeah, they won't do it publicly, you know, but they will talk amongst one another. Um, and it's just a shame we can't, we can't continue to do that because you're right, you know, you get demonized by your competitors. But I don't think it's, it, it, it's not the InfoSec professional that's demonizing anybody. It's, it's the, the, you know, the marketing team, but so, saying, oh, look, you know, they had that big problem. Look, don't use them. Use us. We didn't have that problem, you know. Um, and it's it's the business trying to capitalize on somebody else's misfortune, you know, where it should. I mean, WannaCry, let's look at that. That was a good time when loads of people got together and they went, right, we've got this problem. Okay, how do we fix it? What have we found? What can we do? Um, and I think it was like the... Um, uh, Microsoft had to put a load of Apache into their browsers, and you know Google was involved, and a number of other people were involved as well. Um, we can, as a community, come together to work really well. But uh, I mean, I don't know how this Dora information share thing is going to go. Are they going to? Who's going to create the forum for that? Who's going to regulate that forum? Who's going to like incentivize companies to join that forum? Yeah, well, that's a. A deeper conversation on the Dora side, which I think we will do at some point, James. But we have uh, that coming up, I believe. Yeah, there are some really good prescriptive capabilities, but uh, directives as well, and, and mechanisms that that you'll be able to bake into. And some of the data is anonymized as well, which is good. To all of this point, <clears throat> companies don't want to say, "Hey, this is what happened. Here's how I 
I messed up. It's not good for business and not good for consumer confidence. But just back on the point about the industry, we we proved that you, you both might remember uh, the the Red Goat Group that was was spun up during COVID nineteen. Uh, the cyber volunteers, I believe Lisa Lafour yeah. was one of the the leaders of that. Um, I hope I'm right. I'm pretty sure it was Lisa. Um, mm-hmm. That was a great example. And I listen. I was a part of that group as well. And I was involved in some mal- reverse engineering of malware activities with people that I know were not always on the light side of the fence because of the skills that they had and 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 the way they referred to themselves and some of the tools I was watching them use. So we we do have the ability to, and I'm not saying good and light and good are going to come together and balance the force here, but but there is when there's the need arises, all right, and you know, Cessy is the mother of all invention. We showed in COVID nineteen that we could bring threat intelligence community together to better serve healthcare in this case. Um, so there are lessons. We can learn lessons from these good initiatives that occurred in the last two or three years. Um, and I think that's largely what some of the DORA and NIST2 directors are doing. They're saying, we know we can do this. We know we can do it in a way that's safe and, and, and pseudonymizes some of the, the source data. And by the way, forget that we know we have to do it. We have to do it. It's, 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 it's one of the most underserved elements of threat intelligence is this tribal knowledge capability. Um, and the NCSC are in the UK, or can't even handle the amount of data they've got. They said they said it themselves, we have too much data to disseminate out to third parties that we can't do it. Um, you know, and and so they're struggling. So the only way to solve the problem, I think, in in industry terms, is for the customers to kind of come together and share that data in a way that is possibly not going to expose them, of course, to Oliver's point. But it's the only way to really tackle this because siloed operations have failed us for the last thirty years. I could, I could build an AI for that. <laughs> Yeah, chat GPT, off you go. <laughs> <laughs> you can see Oliver That's dying right. a little bit inside there if you're watching the videos. <laughs> just no, I'm, 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 I'm about to write you a check, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be very nice. Thank you very much. Um, but no, I think, you know, there's there's definitely more to, to discuss out of this one. Obviously, you know, the whole Dora um, and, and kind of like this stuff as well. I know we've got something planned uh, coming up for that. Um, obviously, you know, AI has been beaten around the head quite a bit, but uh, no doubt that will come back as well. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how things pan out. I mean, and I always say this at the end of these types of things, because we do tend to talk about you know, current events and future technology, that kind of stuff, where we think it's going. And I think at the moment, security is so... It's moving in such a kind of strange, not strange direction, but I, I can't see where it's going to go. For the first time in my career, I'm, I'm finding it really difficult to predict where we're going to be in sort of like five years' time. I, I normally have a pretty good view. Okay, you get blindsided and there's a, you know, new things that come out that, that you didn't expect and what have you. But, you you know, anyone in InfoSec can normally kind of see where the track record is kind of going. I can't see it anymore. I, I see too many vendors, too many companies buying other vendors and turning these random products into some random technology you know, um, we're seeing ransomware getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and because it's worth so much money, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. Um, I don't know where we're going to be in five years. It's weird. Maybe it's just me. Maybe other people out there have a much better view, but... It's okay. We'll have AGI by then. We'll be fine. Yeah, you know, and I can have it in my chip, in my brain. <laughs> Oliver, I'm surprised you didn't jump in immediately there. Well done. <laughs> oh, I, you know, well, I just worry. think... <laughs> there was I, I know, like, given, given a long enough time frame, you know, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> One day you'll embrace the AI, Oliver. You'll let it he'll into become, your brain. He'll become an ascensionist like me. He'll be. He'll do it. I, I'm, I'm waiting for all of you lot to upload yourself and then... Peace. And then, <laughs> then, then lord it all over us with your biological form. Just um, quiet. <laughs> absolutely fantastic talking to you guys. And I hope all of you out there had, uh, you know, some good laughs and some good insights as to kind of what we're seeing in the market and, you know, threat intelligence and the whole lock bit thing. It's important that we have these discussions and we continue to kind of generate content that makes you think as well. So if there's anything out there that 
you guys want to hear us discuss or you want us to kind of maybe add a little bit more information to or debate, um, you know, Obviously, we like a good debate. The AI debate went on for, for quite well. It was one of the most downloaded episodes. Um, you know, so just let us know and we will cover these points. We've got all kinds of content that we, we're going to be covering going forward. So to my co-hosts, Oliver and Richard, thank you ever so much, as per usual, for coming in and talking complete weird technology and jibing one another about whether or not we're going to have an AI in our brain. Um, for the last sort of like 50 odd minutes <laughs> uh, it's always a pleasure and i'll let you get back to your normal day-to-day jobs now awesome thanks as always awesome. great to be with you again oliver pleasure yep awesome oh just oliver not me it's okay that's all right you know James, you know well, you, you too, Jim. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so to all of you out there watching thank you ever so much um you know we will be speaking to you again soon please feel free to click the notification and if you're on youtube um, you know like share and subscribe um if you're on spotify equally you know please feel free to sign up and get your, your regular notifications when new new content comes out. Um, and we will be speaking to you again soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.